Welcome to Kingdom Living Ministries, where our vision is knowing God, loving people, and making disciples. We trust this week's message will be a blessing to your life. Enjoy the teaching ministry of KLM. Today we're going to, we've been talking about faith, right, for all year and even starting towards the end of last year. So we're going to continue on that series of faith. And today I'm going to speak about the power of confession. So the title of my message is Faith Speaks, the Power of Confession. And so, you know, confession, and when I talk about confession, I'm talking about confessing the word in faith. Okay, so it's not, and I'm going to get into the different types of confessions there are, but not necessarily, this is not about confessing your sins. This is the power of confessing the word of God in faith. And so this is a spiritual discipline, just along with, um, you know, prayer, the word, um, fasting, all these things, fellowship and gathering together in church. Um, All these are spiritual disciplines, and so is confessing, confessing the word. And so it's kind of gotten lost, though. Not here, because we know PD and we confess the word. We have the, uh, the offering confession. We have um, confession before service. But a lot of times, it's kind of getting lost or, or neglected as a spiritual discipline. Um, but it's important, and we're going to get into that uh, today. <clears throat> so there's four different types of confessions um, in the Bible, especially in the New Testament. So we understand what confession I'm talking about. So the first type of confession is the confession um, to repentance or the confession that you are a sinner. So this is for those who are unregenerated, unsaved. It's confessing that, yes, I have a sin nature, right? It's not confessing individual sins, but it's the confession that, um, that John the Baptist was having the people confess and baptize him that, look, I fall short. I'm recognizing, acknowledging I fall short of the glory of God and I have a sin nature, right? So you're a sinner. The second type of confession is what we see in Romans 10, 9, and 10, that if we confess the Lord Jesus and believe in heart that God raised him from the dead, then we shall be saved. And so that is not confession of sin, but it's confessing Jesus as Lord. It's declaring that truth. So that's the the second type of confession that we see in the Bible, especially in the New Testament. The third is confessing sins that we see in 1 John 1 and 9. That as you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so that would be, that could be an individual sin that you're dealing with that you need to go to God. And we also sometimes confess to one another, especially if you offend someone, right? We are supposed to go to them and ask for forgiveness and confess to them, right? All right. Praise God. So that's, the, that's a third type of confession. And the last one is what we're going to dig into today. Um, And it's confessing and speaking God's will and word in faith. Confessing and speaking and declaring God's will and word in faith. And so I'm going to use the words confession and declaration um, interchangeably. So it's it's going to be the same thing, all right? So in the New Testament, in the Greek, uh, the word that's translated for confession has multiple definitions. And so I'm going to focus on four of them just so you can get a better understanding of what confession is and how it lines up with those four types of confessions that, um, that I mentioned. So the first definition of confession means to, um, the Greek word means to acknowledge, agree, admit, or declare. So to acknowledge. So it's, it's acknowledging just like that first type of confession, acknowledging that you're a sinner when you're not saved, right? That's a, that acknowledgement and also agreeing with what God said about it. Amen? The second definition is um, <clears throat> to admit um, a bad behavior. Okay, so that's as we know, confessing, confessing a sin, confessing that you did, whether it's confessing to God, confessing to someone else. The third, now this is powerful, it says it's an emphatic declaration of a truth. Mm, an emphatic declaration of a truth. And that's how you confess Jesus is Lord. Yes, you acknowledge it. Yes, you're agreeing with what God says, but you are declaring that emphatically. You are declaring that truth that Jesus is Lord. He is Savior, right? That's a declaration. Just as God says, if you confess me before man, I will confess you before my father. That's a declaration of confession. That is a bold declaration of a truth. Amen? And then the last definition that we see in the Greek is something that we're going to focus on today. It means to speak in accordance with or adopt the same terms or language. Speak in accordance with or adopt adopt the same terms or language. So essentially it means to say the same thing as. 
And so that's what we're doing when we're declaring the word. We are saying what God has already said. We are declaring his word in truth. Amen? Amen. All right, so turn with me to the book of John, uh, chapter 12. Amen. And we're going to, when you get there, you say amen. amen. All right. So John 12, go down to verse 49. <clears throat> and this is Jesus speaking. And he says, for I did not speak on my own, but the father himself sent me, who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. And I know what his commandment, is. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as my father has told me. Hmm. So you see that that's what Jesus is doing, that he's confessing, he's declaring, not his own word. He's declaring what the father has already told him. And so that's the same thing we do. We're supposed to be Im imitators of Christ, right? We're his followers. We're his disciples. So just as Jesus, if it's good enough for Jesus, if he just spoke what the father spoke, we do the same thing. We speak what he speaks. We say the same thing. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Now, there's another um, <clears throat> excuse me, definition of, of uh, confession um, that I found in a book that's powerful, and it's talking about declarations, right? And it says, declarations are when we speak out loud, on purpose, for a purpose. So first of all, you have to speak out loud. This isn't something you say within yourself. You speak it verbally. It has to be audible, right? So it's declarations are, what were, are when we speak out loud, on purpose, for a pur purpose. These are statements of faith aligning us with God's will and directives for our lives and the world around us. So when we confess the word, we declare the word, what we're doing is we're aligning ourselves with God's will and his directives for our lives. Now, if you go back, I think it's the first or second message in the series that PD preached in December. He mentioned that we know that what faith comes by hearing, right? And hearing by, right? And he mentioned in that message something powerful <clears throat> that I never heard before. He said, it's also hearing the word within the word. And what he said is that it's, it's the word that God speaks to you individually. Because we know the word is like the general purpose, right? You're going to find out, you know, we know we have to give. We know we're supposed to love and all those things. But what about you? What about for your personal life? It's not going, the Bible's not going to give you, there's nothing in black and white that's going to say, you go and this is, the, this is your specific calling. You have to spend time in the word, spend time with God and listen and get that revelation, that understanding that God speaks to you personally. So that's the word within the word. So when we declare God's will and we declare God's um, um, directives, yes, it's his word, but it's also the word that he speaks to us, those promises, the callings that he has on our lives individually. And we declare that, too, when we speak and confess his word. Amen? All right. All right. So we're still, that's my introduction. We're, we're still going. <laughs> we got a lot. We're going to go deep today. It's going to be good. We're going to go deep today. Um, we're going to set a foundation and we're going to go layers and, and, and deep. And, and so hopefully I don't keep you guys too long. So, so we understand that. So we understand the definition of confession. We understand the four types of confession, but we need to take a step back. Right. And so why does this matter? Like why, why is what we say matter? Because we look throughout scripture from the old Testament, but to the new, we see that words matter and that words are powerful. God is very concerned about what we say. OK, so you don't have to turn to these scriptures because I'm going to go through them quickly. There's a lot to get to. Um, but if, you, if you're taking notes, you want to write them down and, and people listen to this message later, they can. So Psalm 34, 13 says, keep your mouth from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Psalm 37, 30 says the mouth of the righteous utters wisdom and his tongue speaks justice. So we see who's righteous. If you're saved, you're righteous. Right. We have the righteousness of Christ. And so this is a. Um, this is a characteristic of the righteous, that their mouth utters wisdom. So if you're righteous, you should be speaking wisdom and justice. Amen? Proverbs 10.31, the mouth of the righteous flows with wisdom, but the perverted tongue will be cut out. The mouth of the righteous flows with wisdom, but on the other hand, the mouth of the wicked shall be cut out. The tongue of the wicked should be cut out. And Proverbs 21.23 says this. It says, the one who guards his mouth and his tongue guards his soul from trouble. The one who guards his mouth and his tongue guards his soul from trouble. So if you can guard and watch what you say, you can just guard your life from trouble. I say you're not going to have trouble, but you can, you can avoid a lot of trouble just by watching what you say. Amen? 
All right, turn with me to the book of James, James 3. And you know where I'm going. Amen. Most of today I'm going to be reading out of the NSAB, and I know I think we need ESV on the screen, but so it might look a little different. Um, that's just, NSAB is just one of my favorites. I, I like the ESV too. So James 3, 2, <clears throat> we're going to read to through verse 12. So it says, for all, for all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to reign in the whole body as well. So that's similar to what Proverbs was saying, right? That if you can, that's powerful. If you can control your tongue, if you are like a perfect man. Now we know no one's perfect. So what James is saying is here is like, it's hard. It's hard to control what you say. You're going to say some wrong things sometimes, right? But, but, but this is important, right? Pick it up at verse 3. Now, if we put the bits in the horse's, the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their whole body as well. Look at the ships, too. Though they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are nevertheless directed by a very rudder, a very small rudder, wherever the in inclination of the pilot determines. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, just like those comparisons, just like uh, the ship and the, and the horse. It's a small part of the body, yet it boasts great things. See how great a force is set aflame by such a small fire. Hmm. So what's that saying is that what we say, our words are powerful. It, it's, it's using an analogy, a metaphor there, but it's saying that what you say, your words can, call, can be destructive. Set a force on fire, a forest fire, large destruction. One word, one thing you say can cause, like a rumor of something, whatever, it can cause destruction. Mm -hmm. That's how powerful our words are. Hmm. Okay. Pick it up in verse 6. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our body parts as that which defiles the whole body and sets the fire of the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one, no one among mankind can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father and we curse people who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth, both blessings and cursings. My brothers and sisters, these things should not be this way. Does a spring send out from the same O opening both fresh and bitter water? No. Can a fig tree, by my brothers and sisters, bear olives or a vine bear figs? No. Nor shall salt or water produce fresh. Mm, this is powerful. This is a powerful verse. And, and, and so the core thing I want you to take away from that is just the potential your words have. And now we have to be careful with what we say. And so James was talking about the potential of what it can do in the negative. It can just destroy and set things on fire. But how much more in the positive? What if we use our words the right way? If they can powerfully, powerfully destroy, they can powerfully build up when we say the right things. Amen? Praise God. Hmm. Let's go to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, verse 29. And this is the Apostle Paul writing a letter to the church of Ephesus. And he says in verse 29, Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, for if there is any good word for edification according to the need for the moment, say that, say that so it will give grace to those who hear. Unwholesome word. So unwholesome, and it might say something, well, it says unwholesome there, but another definition of that is, is rotten or decayed, as it says. And, and when I think of that, when I think of rotten or decayed, I think of fruit, right? So, so, so I like to think of it as unfruitful. Let no unfruitful word come out of your mouth. Hmm. But what? That is for edification. So because in Ephesians, Paul, the, the message here in, in, this, in context, Paul is talking about the body of Christ and the church and unity. So he's talking about building the body up. And so he's talking about watching your words, what we say to each other, and how we encourage and build each other up, right? So let no unwholesome, no unfruitful word come out of your mouth only for the need of the moment. That's powerful right there. You got, it's not just what you say, but when you say it, okay? All right? So that it will give grace to those who hear. Our words can give grace. Hmm. Our words can empower people, right? Praise God. So, so the, the key message here is to be careful. We have to be careful what we say and make sure it's fruitful. But here, verse 30, this is powerful. 
So it follows up. It says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. So this is in context. Mm -hmm. So what he's saying is what we say, if we speak an unwholesome word, it can grieve the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. It can speak, it can grieve. One of the ways we can grieve the Spirit of God is by saying things that are unwholesome, that are not fruitful to building each other up. Mm -hmm. Hmm. My God, my God. Let's go to Matthew 12. Verse 33. All right. We're still, we're, we're still on the foundation here. Um, <clears throat> so 33 uh, to 37, this is Jesus talking. Either assume the tree to be good as well as the fruit good, or assume the tree to be bad as well as the fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You all spring of vipers. How can you, being evil, express any good thing? For the mouth speaks from what fills the heart, right? Out of the abundance of the mouth, um, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever's in the heart is going to be revealed in, in our words. The, the good person brings out good treasures and, uh, and good things, and the evil person brings out of his evil treasure evil things. But I tell you that every careless word that people, that people speak, they will give account on it for, on the day of judgment. For, the words, for by our words we will be justified, by our words we will be condemned. Mm, powerful. Every idle word, every careless word, everything we say matters. Hmm. My God. So we see there for our words matter and our words have power. Praise God. All right. All right. So now we're going to dig in. Is this good? <clears throat> this is great. <laughs> good, good, good. Praise God. So now we, we kind of have some definitions of confession and declaration. Now we want to just dig deeper and go to another layer of what it is. But what I like to do is... <clears throat> In order to understand deeper what something is, we also have to understand what it's not. So to eliminate error, confusing, and things like that. So let, let, let's look at what confession and, and declaration is not. Okay, so first of all, this is not the law of attraction. Okay? So there, there's a lot of, in, in, in this world, in this new age talk, we hear a lot of this, you know, positive thinking and mind over matter and, and, and what the universe brings and what energy, you put that energy out and you put that back. See, this is not what it is. This is not it. This is not it. And so that's what get, that's how error comes in. That's how error comes in is we have these things and these thoughts out here and people are buying these books and Christians and believers reading these books and they're getting confused. They're getting confused. Now the difference is, now listen, the thing is, using, you know, having positive thoughts and everything and writing things down, those things have value, right? And people can get things from that. But here's the thing, they're getting it in their own effort apart from God. Okay. And so you might be able to get a blessing, but if it's not God ordained, if it's not in God's will, you don't have the grace to maintain that blessing. Because mm. it's one thing to get the blessing, but how do you maintain it? That thing can destroy you. Mm. So we have to get it God's way. <clears throat> so it's, it's, it says this in, um, in, in Tim, and Paul talks about this in, in Timothy, and he talks about how um, bodily training is good, is beneficial partly for this world. But godliness is beneficial in this world and the next. So it's the same principle. Yes, positive thinking is good, but it's limited to this world. But if we're speaking in faith, aligning with God, it has benefits in this world and the next. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So the problem with this is that um, it has a form of godliness. Yeah. It has a form of godliness, according to 2 Timothy, right? 2 Timothy 3, 5. It has a form of godliness, but denies the power, <laughs> denies the power of God and attributes the power to us or some universe or something like that. Right. Hmm. Okay. No. Okay. no. 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 So this is not the law of attraction. We got that, right? Also, and this is what has caused um, a lot of issues in, in the word of faith and, and people criticize this. It's also not just saying what you want. It's not, look, it's not just putting together a wish list. Okay, God is not Santa Claus. He's not a genie. It's not just, see, the thing is, we know that confession is agreement, right? It's coming in agreement with God. But what happens is people want God to come in agreement with them. They want to have, this is what I want, this is what I desire, and God come in agreement with me. And so what they do is they flip through scriptures, they have desires, and they 
take stuff out of context and start to confess that when it's not aligned with what God says. It's not aligned with his will or his word in context. Just cherry picking scripture to fit your agenda. Mm. Let's go to Leviticus. That's dangerous. That's a dangerous thing to do. It's a dangerous thing to do. Let's go to Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 10. <clears throat> Verse 1. See, because God, we have to do things his way and in his order, right? And so we know in the Old Testament, if you look back, there's a lot of order to the sacrifices and things like that, right? So this is in Leviticus, and um, God is kind of, you know, Levitical law. God is setting some order of how people should do things. And uh, we know that Aaron and his sons were the priests, and they were the ones that gave the sacrifices and everything, right? So we pick this up, Leviticus. Um, I'm actually in the wrong one. Let me go to 10. <laughs> Leviticus 10.1. All right. Now Nadab and Abihu, Abihu, excuse me, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans and after putting fire in them, placed the incense on the fire and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he did not command. Mm, this is not what he commanded. And the fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they both died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, it is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy, and before all people, I will be honored. So Aaron therefore kept silent. I like the Bible because sometimes it's funny. It's like, what was Aaron supposed to say? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Are you going to say something get burned up too? Like Aaron was just like, <laughs> Aaron was quiet. But, but, but that's, the, that's the power of that. This is the understanding of not taking scripture out of context, not using um, things just for our own benefit without being in God's will. It's danger. It's dangerous, right? I'm not saying you don't get burned up like they did or a really different company, but understand, <laughs> you might, but but understand, we have to be have to treat his word and confession as holy. Amen. Praise God. Okay, and also in in James four three, we don't have to go there, but it talks about it says you we have not because we ask not, and also we ask amiss. It says that in the um in the in the King James, but it also means to ask with the wrong motives. What are your motives? And what we're speaking and what we're, we're declaring. Amen? Amen. So we have, to, we have to seek God. We have to rightly divide the word of truth Amen. to know what to speak, to know how to speak his, uh, his directives for our lives. Amen? All right, so also we know that it's okay. It's not the law of attraction. It's not just saying what you want. It's also not wishful thinking. Okay? And so what I mean by that is you can't just have a confession like we have the, the offering confession and just, just pet, like you're a parrot and just say that and expect to see results. You have to believe it. Yeah. You have to believe. You have to believe that in your heart, right? Yeah. Mm, my God. Yeah. You have to believe that in your heart. And so relationship is key. Turn to, and, and, um, and that was actually the, the message that uh, Daniel read today, uh, the, the verse Daniel read today, but I want to go back there, Hebrews 4 2. Hmm. And so he's talking, this, this section, the writer's talking about the, the, the children of Israel and how they were just in the desert wandering in unbelief. And it says, for indeed we have the good news preached to us just as they did, but the word they heard did not benefit them because they was not united with those who listened with faith. Okay, they didn't, and another translation says it wasn't mixed with faith. So if we're going to, if we're going to work this, this confession and do it right, it has to be mixed with faith. You have to believe it. Amen. Unbelief is the biggest killer to our dreams, purposes, and growth in your life. Unbelief. 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 Nothing is, is greater hindrance than unbelief. I'm going to show you. Mark, uh, Mark 6. Okay, so in Mark 6, Jesus, the chapter before, has, I mean, he's among crowds. He's healing a bunch of people. He just raised a girl from the dead. So Jesus said, you know what? I'm healing all these people. Let me go to my people. Let me go to Nazareth. Let me take help these people out. Those are my people. Because I'm healing everything else. Let me go to my people. This is going to be good. Not exactly. It says he did not, he could not do any miracle there except he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Amazed at their unbelief. This is Jesus we're talking about. Fully God, fully man. And he was hindered. Hindered by unbelief. Mmm. Mmm. 
The biggest hindrance to the work of God is in your life and in our life is not the devil. It's unbelief. It's unbelief. We see it from Adam all the way to the Pharisees. What was Adam's sin? The first thing he did was he didn't believe. The serpent got him to not believe God. He said, oh, no. He said, oh, you won't surely die. Boom. Oh, unbelief right there. He didn't believe it anymore. Mm. Mm. Unbelief. All right. So we understand what it's not. Clearing up some confusion. So what is it? Well, we know that it is agreement with God. Can two walk together except they be agreed? We have to agree with God, agree with his word. Amen. Um, let's go to Mark. Well, we're already in Mark good, so we'll go to 11, chapter 11. We're going to go at verse 22. Praise God. <clears throat> All right. So and we're going to go 22 to 24. This is Jesus talking. He said, and Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted to him. Therefore, I say to you, all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you receive them and they'll be granted to you. Now, it's an important thing that um, when you when you read scripture and you're studying scripture, Look at different words that are repeated multiple times in a passage. So we have two verses here, right? The word say or a variation of say is repeated five times. The word believe or faith is repeated four times, just in two verses. So we see that saying and believing are intricately combined. These are important together. They're linked. Saying and believing, believing and saying, saying and believing, believing and saying. So what guys, we have to believe what we say. We have to say what we believe. We have to believe what we say and say what we believe. Amen? So that's key. That's key to what confession is. It's an agreement with God. It's declaring his word. But it's saying, it's believing first and saying what we believe. Amen? Praise God. All right, so we understand a little bit deep that words are important. We understand what confession declaration is is not. We understand a little bit more what it is. Now we are going to get to really the heart of what I want to share today, um, and that's, you know, why. Why we confess, why we, um, it's important for us to declare the word of God. Amen? Amen. All right, so let's go to Psalm. This, well, I'll just take you there. It's, It's just one verse, but. You guys can see it. Psalm 119, verse 89. I don't know if you guys, it's hot on stage. I don't know about you guys. Okay. <laughs> All right. Praise God. 119, verse 89. So all, all about, we're asking why now, why we confess. All right. So and this is just one verse. In Psalm 119, 89 says, forever the Lord, your word stands in heaven. That verse says settled in heaven. Other, uh, other scriptures say established in heaven. Okay, so forever his word is established in heaven. It stands there forever, right? What about earth? What about earth? Hmm. Hmm. Let's go to Matthew 6. Let's see about that. This is familiar. Right here, Matthew 6. We're going to pick it up and um, we're going to pick up for 7. Okay. And just... And this is familiar. This is what they call the Lord's Prayer, but really it's the disciples' prayer because this is what he, he told the disciples to pray. So it says, and when you are praying, do not use thoughtless reputation as the gen- repetition as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. Okay? So we're talking about the word being established. It's established forever in heaven. Pray then this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So why do we have to pray? Because his word is established in heaven forever, not on earth. We have to pray for his will to be done here on earth. His kingdom come, his will be done on earth. We establish his word, we establish his kingdom on earth, right? It's by walking out the kingdom. It's living it, it's speaking it, it's declaring it, amen? That's how we, that's that's one of the, the importances of declaring and confessing his word is that it's establishing it on the earth, really establishing it in our lives, in our homes. 
That's what the declaration is about. That's one of the main uh, purposes for it. Amen? And we see again, let's go over to uh, Matthew 16, verse 19. Hmm. Jesus says, I will be, he's talking to Peter here. This is when Peter had the revelation that Jesus was Lord. And he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be, shall, shall have been bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. So this is also establishing that because the, the right translation of this is saying we bind what has already been bound in heaven. We loose what has already been loosed in heaven. So how it is in heaven, we establish it here on earth. God has given us that, that, that commandment and that authority. So one of the reasons why it's important to declare the word, the will of God in our lives on earth is because we establish it. We establish the kingdom on this earth. Amen? Mm, mm, mm. Praise God. All right. Now, now, so that's one reason establishing his word. What's another reason why uh, we need to confess and declare the world, word? One is because it builds our faith. It builds our faith. Amen? Faith comes by and hearing by. Hmm. Faith comes by hearing. and the hearing of the word of God, right? So let's say you are, um, you're confessing, you know, you're declaring the word in the will, and you're like in the room by yourself, right? You're speaking it. Who hears that? You, you. Blue. So faith comes by. So you hear what you spoke in faith, right? right? And you hear, and faith comes by what? Hearing. hearing, right? Hearing the word of God, right? And so as you hear that, you believe it and you get it in your heart, right? Right, and we also know we read it earlier. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak. So you get that in your heart, and you speak it out. And so what happens when you speak it out? You hear it. And then what happens when you hear it? You believe it. And what happens when you believe it? You speak it. So it's just reinforcing it. So the more you speak, the more you hear. The more you hear, the more you believe. The more you believe it, the more you speak it. The more you speak it, the more you hear it. The more you hear it, the more you believe it. The more you believe it, the more you speak it. The more you speak it, the more you believe it. The more you believe it, the more you speak it. The more you speak it, the more you hear it. The more you hear it, the more you believe it. The more you believe it, the more you speak it. And it's a cycle. It's a cycle, and it's building your faith up every time you speak in that word. Come on. Amen. My God, my God, my God. Let me, sh let me show you an example of this. Let me show you an example of this, all right? Let's go to Genesis 17. <laughs> Genesis 17. <clears throat> all right. Now, Abram was 99 years old, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me. And be blameless. I will make my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. So no longer shall you be named Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations, I will make you. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and your descendants after throughout your generations as everlasting covenant to, to, be God, uh, to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Okay, so here God changed his name from Abram to Abraham. And Abraham means, the translation of that means uh, father of many nations, right? So once his name was changed, and everybody knew that, when Abraham woke up in the morning next to his wife Sarah, she said, Good morning, Father of many nations. He goes into the kitchen. He has servants. Right? Abraham was rich, right? He has two servants in there. Good morning, Father of many nations. Hey, Father of many nations. He goes out into the field, right? Abraham had so much land. We know what the scripture said because him and Lot, they had to separate because there was too much land. Their, their, their servants were fighting stuff. So let's say conservatively he had 100 servants, 100 people working in the field. He goes out there. Going there. So over a hundred times a day, he hears Father of Many Nations, Father of Many Nations, Father of Many Nations, Father of Many Nations. He meets somebody. What's your name? Father of Many Nations. Yeah. Listen, that word everywhere he went, hundreds of times, just conservatively, at least a hundred times a day, he's having the promise of God that God spoke to him repeated to him. And he's repeating it out 
all the time. All the time. I used to think, because it talks about how Abraham hoped against hope, and I was like, how could he do that? Because this thing was embedded in him. Every day, the promise of God. You know how you get a word from God or a prophecy, and you might write it down? A couple of months, you forget it. You got to go look for it. Abraham had to do that every morning, every day. That promise was being spoken to him because it was his very name. Mm. Let's go to Romans 4. Talking about Abraham here. Romans 4, verse 20. Mm. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able to perform. That's the result of confession. That's the result of him hearing his, his promise repeated to him and him declaring that promise all the time, all the time that he believed. He did not waver in faith. That's the power of repetition, that we declare the word. We declare that promise until we get it. We keep declaring it. We keep declaring until we get tired of it. We keep declaring it. Amen? Hmm. Praise God. All right. So we know that we, the, the, the reason we confess is it, it establishes his word. It builds our faith. And also, it changes situations. Let's go to Mark. Mark 5. Mark 5. We're going to go to verse 25. We're talking about the woman with the issue of blood. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. Praise God. So we'll start reading 25. <clears throat> so a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years had endured much of the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but instead had become worse. <clears throat> Verse 27, this is a key verse, ready? After hearing about Jesus, after hearing about Jesus, faith comes by hearing. hearing. Faith comes by hearing. hearing the word of God. Who is Jesus? He's the word of God. The word became flesh. He is the word. She heard the word. She heard the word. She heard about Jesus. She heard about the word. Mm, mm, mm. So that built up her faith. So she came into the crowd behind him and touched his cloak for she, here we go, key verse, she had been saying to herself, she had been saying to herself, that's why I like it, saying, 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 she had been saying, not once, she had been saying to herself, meaning that she heard the word, she got faith, and she confessed that thing, and she had been saying, continuing to confess the word to herself. If I touch his garment, I will get well. Here's the other key thing. Mm, she made that thing personal. She said, if I touch. I don't, there's a big crowd out here. I don't care if anybody else gets healed. I don't care if he touched anybody else. If I touch him, if I touch him, I'm getting healed. There's a bunch of people out there that were spectators. They just wanted to see. They wanted to see the miracles. She was like, I'm a participant. I'm participating in this. If, if I, you make it personal. So you make your, the word of God personal. Mm, 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 mm. My God, my God. You, if, if you know that it's saying by stripe, I am healed. You make that personal, right? You, in John, it says that, Beloved, I wish, I wish beyond all that you would be prospering me in health. I will prosper and I will be in health. You make that personal and you confess that back. My God. Mm. Oh, man. All right. All right. He said take your time. I was, uh, let me go here because I wasn't going to but we'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll take this. All right. All right. It's, 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 I'll try to. All right, let's go to 2 Kings 4. 2 Kings 4, 12. All right, praise God. Praise God. Mm. Man. All right. So I'll just set this up. Um, this is uh, Elijah, Prophet Elijah. Um, Elijah is actually one of my favorite characters in the Bible, him and Elijah. I like. And so um, <clears throat> he's going to this to a Shunanite woman who um, has set up a room in her house for any time he comes to town to stay. Her and her husband set up the room. And so she's been doing all these great things, you know, been hospitable to him. And so uh, Elijah goes to his servant and says, okay, um, how can I help this woman out? I want to bless her, right? want to take care of her. And so we'll pick it up and, um, in verse 14. And he said, um, what then can I do for her pretty much? And, and his servant Gehazi answered, it is the fact that she has no son and her husband is old. 
And so he said, okay, call her. And basically he prophesied, says, basically, he says, you you know, by this time next year, you're going to have a son. And she was like, no, my Lord, you man of God, do not lie to me, servant. But he, she conceived and had birth, right? So let's pick it up uh, in 18. So when the child was grown, the day it came, when he went out to his father, to the reapers, and he said, my head, my head. And his father said, servant, carry him to his mother. And then when he carried to when he carried him and brought him into his mother, he sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. He died. He's dead. And she went up and laid him in the bed of the man of God. She didn't go to his room. She didn't just keep him on the couch. She didn't go to the hospital. She took him to the man of God's room, laid him on his bed, shut the door, and left. And then she called to her husband and said, please send me one of your servants and one of the donkeys so that I can run to the man of God in return. And he said, why are you going to him today? It's not new moon. It's not Sabbath. She said, and, and I like, I think, in the, in the, old, in the, uh, in the King James, it says, it is well. Her son is dead. But she said, it is well. Mm, mm, mm. Okay. So she goes, uh, drives the donkey. She says, don't go slow. Keep up with the pace. Um, so she went and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. And when the man of God saw her in the distance, he he said to Gehazi, his servant, behold, that is the, per the person there is the Shunammite. Please run now to meet her and, and say, is it going well for you? Is it going well for your husband? Is it going well for your child? And then she said, it is going well. She told Gehazi, it's going well. Her son is dead. It is going well. That's her confession, right? And then she, then when she gets to uh, Elijah, she says, uh, did not I ask for, did not, did I ask for a son of my Lord? Did I not say, uh, do not f give me false hope? And, and then he said to Gehazi, get ready. He, well, Elijah said to Gehazi, get ready, take up my staff, and let's go and meet. Um, if you meet anyone, do not greet him. Uh, and if anyone greets you, do not reply to him. I lay my staff on the boy's face. So I'm just going to uh, uh, skip down um, to 32 when Elijah entered the house. So Elijah entered the house, and behold, the boy was dead. He laid on his bed. He entered, shut the door behind him, um, behind them both, and he prayed to the Lord. And then he, he got up from the bed and lay on the child and put his mouth on his mouth, his eyes on his eyes, and his hands on his head. And he bent down to him, and the flesh of the child became war. Then he returned and walked around the house back and forth once, and then he went down and to the boy and sneezed seven times, and then he called Gehazi and said, call the shooting light woman. She called him and pick up your son. So he's alive. So we see that miracle. And so the point is, even when situations are dead, even when there's no life, you continue to speak. She said, it is well. She said, it is well. She kept saying it. She wasn't ignoring the facts. She knew her son was dead, but she said, I don't need to talk to my husband. I don't need to talk to your servant. I'm going to the man of God who represented God, the voice of God. I'm going to the source, and I know he can fix this. He can make that right. And she continued to make that positive confession. Because mm. mm. she knew we serve a God, according to Romans 4, who bring, brings dead things to life and speaks to things that, into existence that don't even exist. Don't even exist. That's the God we serve. <sighs> Praise God. Praise God. All right. All right. So we know words are powerful, right? And, we, and, and you know, many of us have <clears throat> heard, like, negative words in our lives, whether it's from, from family, teachers, managers, different things like that. And, you know, words, words are also seeds. They're seeds that come into a, into our heart, into our lives, right? And um, every time we hear a negative word or we hear things, that seed is watered. And it, it can be from people. It could be something we speak out. It can be from uh, the media. You know, we hear just negative reports, whether it's social media or just listening to the news or, or whatever. And so that, it, it continues to water those negative seeds. And so that's why God says we have to be careful by what we hear. Because both faith and fear come by hearing. Yes. Faith comes by hearing, but so does fear. Yes. Fear comes by hearing. Doubt comes by hearing. Hmm. Right. Hmm. Right. Let's go to Numbers 13. Woo! I'm finishing up here, but let's go to Numbers 13. Oh Numbers 13, 30. Hmm. And so this is the time when um, Moses had sent the spies. You know, they're in the, the children of God are, are they're in the wilderness, and they went to spy out. Um, the promised land. So then Caleb, he was one of the spies, he quieted the people before Moses and said, we should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will certainly prevail, prevail over it. But then the men who had gone up with him, these are the same people, they saw the same things. They said, we are not able to go up against the people because they are too strong for us. 
and they brought a bad report of the land, which they had spied out to the sons of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants. All the people whom we saw in it were people of great stature. We also saw the, Neph the Nephilim, they were the sons of Anak and the sons of Nephilim, those are the giants, and they were like, we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and, and so we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Uh, 14 uh, verse 1, then all the congregation raised their voices and cried out and wept all night. The word of fear, and they were in fear, crying all night. But there were two different reports brought. It wasn't, they just didn't hear the negative. There was also a positive report brought. So what you believe, what you receive, you have a choice. You have a choice. There, you can't stop the negative words from coming. You can't stop what people say. But you can choose what you receive in your heart and what you're going to believe. And what you're going to confess. Mm, they made a choice. That's what, mm, my God. That's why we have to be careful about what we share, sharing our dreams with people and, and things like that. You need to be, you need to only share with people you know who believe, who have faith. You know, if you, if you need a miracle, if you need prayer for something, don't just, I mean, I don't mind. I, I don't know. Like, I just, I'm not one who just puts it out on social media because, you know, there's hundreds of people. I don't know if they got faith. I don't know what they're praying. I don't know what they're praying. I need people I know who believe. If I need something, I want to get around people who believe. Hmm. See, we think about Jesus a lot of times when he went to, to heal somebody, he kicked people out. He said, I just need a few. Mm. Mm. He kicked people out. And, uh, and Mark, when he went to heal Jairus' daughter, he, he didn't even take all his disciples. He said, give me Peter, give me James, give me John. The rest of y'all wait out here. I need, some, I need a small group who believes. And he took their parents and he kicked everybody out the house because he couldn't be hindered by the unbelief because unbelief does hinder us. Mm. The woman with the issue of blood, it didn't say she told anybody else. She spoke to herself. She declared that thing herself. The Shunite woman, she didn't tell her husband. Her, his son is dead. He didn't even tell him. He's like, I don't need that doubt. Mm. I don't need that doubt. I'm going to confess. Mm. Mm. Don't let the seeds take root because what happens is it's just like the parable of the sower. When, if you have seeds of doubt in you, and it has those, those weeds and those thorns, it chokes out the seeds of faith. It chokes out those good words. So we can't let those things take root in us. Amen? Amen. We don't receive them. We don't receive them. According to 2 Corinthians 10, 5, we take captive every thought, every thought to the, under the authority of God. We take that thing captive. Amen? Hmm. My God. Let's go to... Just said that Mark. Let's give an example of this. Yeah, let's go to Mark, uh, Mark 5. And I have one more verse after this. Mark 5, verse 22. Hmm. <clears throat> and we were just there because this is the same story with the, the one issue of blood. So, and, a, and one of the synagogue officials named Jairus came and upon seeing him, seeing Jesus, fell at his feet and pleaded with him earnestly, saying, My daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him and a large crowd following him. So let's, uh, and then the woman who issue blood comes, interrupts him, and that whole episode, and let's pick it up in, thir in, in verse 35. So listen, see, he's still talking. He just, uh, in 34, he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. So he's still talking to the woman who issued blood. While he's speaking, while he's speaking, it says this in verse 35, People came from the house of synagogue saying, your daughter, going to Jairus and say, your daughter has died. Why bother the teacher further? But Jesus, overhearing them, and I love what it says in the Amplified. The Amplified says this. It says, overhearing but ignoring what they said. Mm, that's powerful. <laughs> overhearing but ignoring what they said. Sometimes you're going to hear the negative. You're going to hear the bad report. You might hear it, but you can ignore that thing. Mm, 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 mm. My God. Overhearing but ignoring what was being spoken, he said to the synagogue official, do not be afraid, only believe. Mm, only believe. We don't have to receive those negative words in our lives. We don't have to receive those things. We have to fight by declaring God's will, God's word in faith. Amen? Amen. So we, and, and we see in um, Ephesians, Paul talks about putting on the whole armor of God, right? Talks about putting on the helmet of salvation. 
the blessed breastplate of righteousness, right? The 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 um the belt buckle of truth, right? The word, the spirit, the word, uh, the word of God, and the sword of the spirit. And he says, and the shield of faith, the shield of faith. What's the purpose of it? It quenches the fiery ar- the ar- darts of the enemy. Amen. We have to keep our shield up because those darts of doubt and unbelief, all those things are coming. How do we defeat that? How do we overcome that? We overcome that with our shield of faith, keeping it up, and the word of God. We speak in the word of God. That's our weapon. It's speaking. That's how we go on the offensive. It's speaking his word, speaking that word, declaring, declaring it, declaring his will, declaring what he spoke to us personally, declaring the promises of God over your children, over your home, over your family, declaring it. Mm. That's what confession is. That's why we do it. That's why it's important. My God, we keep our shield up. Last scripture, John 5. First John five, <clears throat> verse four. Whoever has whoever has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. My God, our faith is what overcomes. So if we use that faith as a weapon, as we speak it out, we have overcoming faith. It's not just getting by faith. It's not just making it big. It's victorious overcoming faith. That's what we have. That's what we live. That's what we speak out, and that's how we overcome all those doubts, all those negative things. I don't care what's been planted in your heart. I don't care what's in there, what's choking out those seeds of faith. We have overcoming faith. You have the faith that can overcome that because we have the faith that's already overcome the world. Amen? Praise God. Hallelujah. My God, let me pray for you. Let me pray. Let me pray. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, God. Thank you, God. Hallelujah, Lord. Uh, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, God. We thank you for your word, God. Uh, we thank you, God, for the power of confession, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for depositing your word, your truth in our hearts, Father God. Mm, in the name of Jesus, Lord. Uh, we commit, Lord. We commit, Lord, to speak this word. We commit to hear. We commit to hear your word, Lord. Receive it in our hearts, Lord, and speak it. Faith is believing and speaking, Lord. We thank you for it, God. I pray for everyone here and everyone listening to my voice, whether in a digital format, God. Mm, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray, Lord, I come against any seed that, of doubt that has been planted and negativity in their hearts. We declare that we uproot those things now in the name of Jesus, Lord. We thank you, Father God, that this word has penetrated their hearts, Father God. Lord, that they will not just be hearers of the word, but doers as well, Father God. This word will not return void, Father God, but it will accomplish the purpose that you set it forth to do, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that we will be people of faith, Lord. We will not be unbelievers. We will not hinder the work of God by doubts in the name of Jesus, Lord. Hmm, hmm, hmm. I pray that we will only speak what is fruitful, Lord, to each other to edify the body of Christ, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we will confess your word, Lord. Your word that you, your will and your word and your word that you've spoken to us specifically, Lord, and to declare our, your directives for our lives, Father God, and we will see those things come to pass hmm, over our lives, our households, our children, Father God, in the name of Jesus, our church, Lord, our community, Lord. Hmm, we thank you, Father God, that we establish your word, your kingdom, with kingdom living ministries. We establish your kingdom here on this earth, partly by what we say and declare, Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord. We thank you for that, Lord. Uh, with every head bowed and eye closed right now, mm-hmm. if there's anybody, whether you're, you're watching on video or anybody here, if you have not made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, if you have not made that, that initial confession, that initial uh, confessing that you're a, a sinner and confessing God, confessing Jesus as Lord, if you haven't done that, I would ask you to raise your hand. Or if you want to rededicate your life, you can raise your hand. Praise God. And if there's anybody watching, that is in that category. Let's, let's pray this prayer after me for everybody watching in the name of Jesus. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you and I confess that I am a sinner and I need a Savior. Jesus, you are Lord and you are Savior. So I say, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin and set me free. I confess, Lord, that you died for me and that you rose for me, and you overcome, you overcame sin and death, and now I'm forever yours in your family. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. 
That concludes this week's message, and thank you very much for listening. For more information about Kingdom Living Ministries, please call us at 732-324-2200 or visit our website at kingdomlivingnj.org. Also, you can write to us by mail at P.O. Box 519, Rancocas, New Jersey, 08073. And lastly, if you would like to partner with this ministry through your prayers or financial support, contact us via email at partners at kingdomlivingnj.org. Our prayer is that this message has encouraged you to live out the kingdom of God daily in your life by your obedience to His Word. God bless you.